Imagine that your players are in a cave. Maybe their passive perception allows them to catch a flash of movement out of the corner of their eye. But when they look around, they only see dark stone. Then, when they've been walking without incident for a while, surprise attack. You describe a broad shape, a 10 foot wide patch of sheer darkness dropping from the ceiling onto one of the characters, maybe the wizard. You describe a piercing pain as rows of sharp teeth dig into the wizard's head, the cold, slimy sensation of its thickly muscled body. She can feel its hot breath on her scalp and neck, fetid and moldy, but before she can cry out, leathery flesh wraps around her face. The rest of the party watches in horror as their wizard nearly disappears beneath an inky shroud. She can't see, she can't breathe, and she can't hear what the rest of the party hears. Low, inhuman moans beginning to echo through the caverns. Then you call for wisdom saves and initiative rolls. Now let's rewind and imagine that same encounter delivered in a different way. Your players are in a cave. A cloaker takes a surprise bite attack against the wizard. The wizard is blinded and unable to breathe. Two other cloakers on the ceiling use their moan ability. Everyone make wisdom saves and roll initiative. Which one of these descriptions generated questions? Interest, excitement, even fear. If your players were actually being ambushed in a cave instead of rolling dice at a table in your living room, it would be chaotic. They'd be in the dark. They'd have seconds to identify what is attacking them and fight back. By describing what the characters see and experience instead of just reading off a monster name, you're helping your players immerse themselves in the scene. Especially if you play with experienced tabletop gamers, there's a high likelihood that they'll know at least a little about whatever monster they're facing. But even if they're not intentionally metagaming, being able to call to mind the stat block of the creature they're facing does not a thrilling combat make. Adding mystery and creative description to your creatures can help your players see even a classic monster with fresh eyes. And remember, monsters don't have to look the way they're described or drawn in the source books either. Maybe these cloakers live in caves of white stone, so they're albino. Maybe this one is heavily scarred from a previous encounter. Your monsters should be individuals. And once you start thinking about how to differentiate them from each other, you open up all kinds of possibilities for making each encounter unique. Maybe the cloaker is infected with some parasite, worms that spill out of its mouth, driving it into a reckless madness and risking infecting anyone it bites. Or maybe you take the cloaker stat block and completely reflavor it. Now it's a giant leaf bug that lives in the forest and wraps people in its massive leaf wings, sticky with sap. Its moan attack becomes a low droning buzz created with their wings. And instead of getting bonuses when in darkness, it thrives in direct sunlight. Tabletop sourcebooks exist to help you, not to constrain you. Even if you don't feel confident changing up how much damage a creature deals or what abilities it has, swapping around its appearance, its creature type, its damage type, that stuff has almost no effect on how it actually functions in combat. So get crazy, get weird, and show your players some monsters that they have never seen before, even if they've definitely seen them before. Of course, a monster can be interesting without being actually dangerous, which is why this tip isn't very useful on its own. You've got to combine it with the next one to make sure that your players actually get to see what your spicy new take on a classic monster can do. What are you doing? Is that a time travel ritual? I missed the Kickstarter for the Vagabond's Guide to Delriada from Penny Dragon Games. I have to go back in time so I can get my hands on that Celtic inspired setting. It's full of new content for DMs and players. You don't need to do that. You this can... book has everything. New monsters, magic items, spells, races, and subclasses. No, I know. It has whole pantheons of new deities, an adventure campaign for levels one through five, and tons of maps and lore for my game. I can't believe I missed this. You're not listening. You don't have to travel through Time. Listen, I know there are risks to using untested magics like this. I could be disfigured or lose my mind or even die. But it's worth it for the Vagabond's Guide to Del Riata. Wait, no! Man, if she survives, she's gonna be really mad to hear about the late pledge link where she can not only get the book, but a special bonus one-shot. Ooh, banana. We've all been involved in combat encounters where we just go through initiative order a few times, everybody hitting whatever's right in front of them as hard as they can, until the monsters have taken more damage than their hit point total, and they die. You know, 
a math problem. And no matter how scary or intriguing your opening description is, the actual combat can still be boring if there's no real threat and if the fight doesn't demand any strategy. Now, when I say real threat, I don't necessarily mean that the monster has to deal a lot of damage or have a lot of hit points. In fact, I think increasing damage and HP is probably the most boring way to make a combat more challenging, because what it's really doing is just making the combat last longer. If you want your players to have to use strategy, you need to make sure your monsters are using strategy. The problem is, you are not a cloaker. You don't live in a cave, stalking your prey in the darkness, ready to suffocate your dinner. Probably. So it's not surprising that you don't intrinsically know how to do those things in the most effective way, but a cloaker would know those things. Your players are wandering into their territory. The cloakers have home field advantage. They know how to navigate this area and hunt in it. Meanwhile, your players are in an unfamiliar space fighting unfamiliar enemies. They should feel that disadvantage during the encounter. The more you can fake that kind of instinctual expertise in your monsters, the more interesting and challenging they'll be to fight. For example, on Keith Ammon's blog, The Monsters Know What They're Doing, he notes that cloakers only get the ability to blind their target when they have advantage on their bite attack. So unless they have another way to get advantage, it's crucial that their initial attack be a surprise. That means they would be very unlikely to use their moan, which frightens opponents, before they attack. It would give them away. Instead, Keith suggests that the moan is the perfect feature to use if a cloaker retreats, to stop the players from following it. Likewise, cloakers have a feature called phantasms that's basically just mirror image. This feature takes an action to use, but it doesn't have a time limit, and it doesn't make any sound that could give away its position, so a cloaker would know to use that feature before it attacks. If I don't think about those features in context before I run the encounter, I'll probably use them ineffectively and reactively. I might have the cloakers kick off the fight with a moan, wanting to frighten the characters, but not realizing that I'm accidentally kneecapping its bite ability. Maybe it attacks the barbarian, who easily succeeds the strength save to free itself. The cloaker starts getting hit, and only then do I realize that they don't really have that much HP, so it wastes an entire turn using phantasms to try and defend itself. Next thing you know, it's round three and all of my cloakers are dead. There was never a time when my players felt like this combat carried any risk, and they probably didn't have to think any further than choosing their highest damage dealing attack and targeting the closest creature. Now let's rewind and imagine that same combat if the cloakers know how to be cloakers. All three use phantasms silently while they're stalking the party. The lead cloaker then chooses its victim, the wizard, who appears physically weakest and will probably have trouble fighting it off. The cloaker attacks from a stealthy position, getting advantage and blinding her. The other two use moan from the ceiling, which gives away their position, but also allows them to drive the party away from the leader. Now, not only is it harder for characters to get close enough to the wizard to help free her, even their ranged attacks have a chance of hitting a duplicate instead of the cloaker itself. And when they do hit the cloaker that's wrapped around her, she takes half that damage, which is a real threat to her. And since she can't breathe, she can't talk, which means no spells with verbal components. Suddenly, the party needs to problem solve. How do they help free the wizard without hurting her? Should they prioritize stopping the cloakers on the ceiling from controlling the battlefield with their fear effect? This becomes a dynamic, threatening battle where hitting the hardest isn't necessarily the smartest solution. Which encounter would you rather play? Of course, it's not just the monsters themselves that make combat exciting. All of this is maybe half the battle, but you also need to consider the setting, the narrative context, and how to create a feeling of real tension at the table. To learn all that and become a true master of combat, check out this video next.